the kids when they go. Good afternoon. I would like to call to order the Cabarrus County Board of Commissioners for our work session for June the 2nd, 2014. Um, for those of you in the audience, I would like to do a reminder. If you have a mobile device, please put it on silent or vibrate so that it does not go off during the meeting. Commissioners, the first thing that we have is the approval of the work session agenda, including changes. So at this time, may I have a motion to approve the agenda with the changes? So moved. Have a motion. Is there a second? second. Motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. First items, discussion items with no action. We're going to start off with um, Kasha Thompson. Presentation of 2014 community survey results. Good afternoon. We are here to discuss the 2014 community survey, which we've discussed a few times in the previous commissioner meetings. This is Chris Tatham with ETC Institute, our survey administrators, and I'll turn it over to him. Great, it's uh, super to be here. Uh, our firm, if you'll see the next slide, just because it shows you a little bit of, uh, I guess one more, there we go. I guess maybe it's not in there. Anyway, I'll tell you a little bit about our firm. Uh, ETC Institute, we're actually based in Kansas City. We have offices in Chicago, Arizona, uh, and also in Atlanta. And we do work all across the country. In fact, over the last 20 years, I've surveyed uh, more than 1,000 communities across the United States. Uh, we have benchmarking data that has responses for more than 2 million residents. So it helps you interpret what the results mean. So if you see 62%, is that good or bad? How does it compare? So what I'm going to do today is share with you how your results have changed over the past couple years, give you some feedback about what your residents currently think, and give you some insight on the trends and what's happening and how Comparis County compares to the rest of the country. As far as the overall purpose of the survey, really it's designed to give you an objective assessment for what your residents think. Uh, in most communities, only about 5% of the general public ever attend a public meeting. As a result, you typically hear from people who don't like how you're doing things or from people who want to change how you're doing it. You typically don't hear from the average resident because they're happy with the services they get or they think they're okay. They're, and they continue to go on with their busy lives and they don't have time to actually share with you what they think. So a tool like this helps you hear from the larger uh, populace so you can actually balance that input with the people who you do here at your meetings. We have data in this survey dating back from 2008. Uh, we also have some questions in here to help you set priorities so you can kind of see where you should be going uh, in the years ahead. Uh, as far as the major, uh, the methodology for the survey, which is on the next slide, uh, we administered the survey to a little over 400 residents. Uh, the results have a precision of 90, uh, plus or minus 4.8% at the 95% level of confidence. And what that really means is if we did the survey 100 times, 95 times out of 100, you get the same results within about 5%. So it's not perfect, but it's a pretty good indicator about what people think. Uh, the survey was long. The average resident took them a little over 15 minutes to complete. So people did invest themselves in the survey, but we had a very good response rate about it. One out of three households actually took the time to complete the survey, and that's typically a little above average compared to other communities. As far as the location of survey respondents, you can see that in this chart. Uh, we actually don't zero in to the specific household to protect the confidentiality of the respondents, but we do do this so we can actually analyze the results for different areas of the county. And you'll see in the main report, we actually have a number of maps that show different services and how people in different parts of the county rate those services. This is just to give you a good idea of where people responded so you can be comfortable that we did get a good distribution geographically. In addition, if you look at the survey results by the demographics compared to the most recent census, you'll see that they match very, very closely. And for those reasons, we feel like we have a very uh, representative sample. As far as our major conclusions, uh, a lot of times I like to give these up front and then kind of walk you through how I got there. Uh, but these are really it. I mean, the residents of this community really have a very high regard for the county, uh, the county as a whole, and also the county government. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice when I show you some of the comparisons to other communities is you rank significantly above the national average. In fact, in every area that you were compared, you were above the national average, and you were significantly above in 15 of the 23 areas that we assess. So you're in many ways setting a standard. 
As far as the overall satisfaction, it's improved in pretty much every category that was assessed dating back to 2008. And what you'll see as you look at the data, employment opportunities and economic development are relatively high priorities. It doesn't surprise me. They tend to be high priorities throughout the country. But of the issues that we assessed here, they ranked relatively high. With that said, here's how we got there. The first is the perceptions of the county. And you'll notice on this first chart, that next chart that follows, you'll see that we've had residents rate items on a scale of one to nine. The eights and nines are in dark blue. You'll see seven and eights, which are also positive ratings in lighter blue, kind of a neutral rating or kind of the mid rating is in white. And then negative ratings are in red. And one of the things that'll stand out to you when you see this chart is that there's a lot of dark blue. And typically, when we look at communities, we're looking for what we call brand equity. In other words, does the county government, does the county as a community have very strongly positive feelings toward it? And when you look at this chart, you'll notice that everything is a place to raise children, place to live, perceptions of safety. A high number of uh, items on this list have more than 50% of your residents giving you ratings of eight or nine. So it's a very desirable community. Most of the perceptions are very favorable. In fact, the two that really have uh, the greatest impact on strategic perceptions of county government as you work your way through the list at the very bottom you'll see value for taxes and fees people also think oh my gosh we got 22 percent of the people giving negative ratings this is actually a much better rating in most communities you'll see all together you have 65 percent of the respondents giving you positive ratings in most communities that's about 47 percent so you're substantially above and you'll see for every person that complains about the value for tax dollars 22 percent there's almost one and a half people giving the very best ratings of nine or of eight or nine so all in all in addition look at the quality of county services you'll see the overall quality that's about the fifth from the bottom you'll see 79 percent of residents gave positive ratings only 11 percent gave negative rating. So again, for every person that complains about county services, there's actually seven people out there that feel pretty good about what you're doing. But unfortunately, most of those people just take that for granted. So you typically only hear from those who are giving you the more negative responses. Uh, in addition, on the next chart, we looked at the perceptions of living in the county. And you'll see some of the specific aspects of some of the services, courthouse facilities, education facilities. I won't read the entire list to you. But generally, again, we see strong ratings, lots of brand equity. In fact, of the items on the list, all but three have a third or more of the residents giving you the most intensely positive rating. Uh, you'll see employment opportunities is down at the bottom of the list with 32 percent or about a third of the folks who are dissatisfied with that, but you made significant progress from 2010, so you're moving in the right direction, and I'll show you those trends in just a little bit. As far as the next thing I want to share with you is just the perceptions countywide. And you might look at this chart and you say, wow, the entire county is the same color of light blue. Thanks, Chris, for flying all the way out here from Kansas City. What does this really tell me? What this really shows you is that you're doing a great job of equitably providing services in all areas of the county. It's very unusual for an entire county or any community to have the same rating countywide. And you'll notice that when we actually did the mean rating with regard to the overall quality of county services, we essentially got the same rating in every area of the county. So you're not neglecting one area at the expense of the others or over delivering services in another. You're pretty much meeting expectations the same throughout the uh, county. There are some services where there are some differences, but all in all, you're doing a good job of making sure those services are fairly uniform uh, regardless of where residents live. Next thing is just to show you a little bit of how you stack up to other communities. And this is, I think, one of the things that hopefully you'll be very pleased uh, with the fact because you don't get to this position by accident. You know, for the first chart just shows you kind of how you stack up on some basic uh, attitudinal things as a place to live, raise children, place to retire, and as a place to work. And you'll see in all four of these key areas that we use to assess the health of a community, you rank significantly above uh, the national average. In fact, when you look at the next chart, and we actually added some questions related to perceptions of safety in county parks and neighborhood parks, you'll see in each of those cases, you'll notice in the safety in county parks, you're rated 0.7 points above the national average. And that may not mean a lot to you, but differences of 0.2 or greater are statistically significant. And you'll see you were 0.6 per point or 0 0.6 above the national average when it comes to perceptions of safety in neighborhood at night, which typically is one of the most difficult areas for communities to do well in. 
The next chart shows how you stack up and just percent general perceptions of the community. And ease of travel in the county is one area I'm going to show you that has actually decreased in satisfaction, but you're still doing much better than the national average. As I mentioned before, the value you get for uh, the residents get for their taxes and dollars rate significantly above the national average. And you'll see your overall county quality of county services towers above the national average at 6.8 compared to 6.1. And generally, most residents feel pretty good about the pace of growth. Uh, in the community compared to other communities nationwide. And when you look at some of the importance of certain programs and services, you'll see that parks, recreation, your library, emergency preparedness, and curbside recycling all rated a little bit higher here than other communities. And that's not that unusual uh, when you're doing well in the core services. In other words, when you're delivering uh, public safety services well, people tend to start to prioritize parks. They tend to start to prioritize emergency preparedness, recycling. So the fact that these are actually a little bit more important here than we see in other communities didn't surprise me. And the last couple charts that I really think is a big kudos to your staff is the culture of customer service. One of the reasons I think you see such high ratings across the board is that in every ca category of customer service that was assessed, this county rated significantly above the national average. Just look at how quickly staff respond to requests. In most communities, the rating's less than six. Here it's 7.2. Uh, you can see how well issues are handled. Most community is 5.8. You're at 7.3. So you're just really doing a lot of things right when it comes to meeting the individual needs of your residents. And I think you're staff should be commended because you don't get to these ratings by accident. This tends to be the culture of excellence and you certainly have built that and sustained it uh, based on the analysis that we've done. Uh, last couple of things I want to share with you are just how things have changed since the last survey. And what's interesting on this next chart is a list of the long-term trends. And we actually made an error when we put this together. There were no significant decreases. We actually tweaked a couple of the questions. So actually nothing went down since 2008. So you're actually moving in the right direction across the board. When you look at some of the areas that improved or saw imp significant increases from 2010, you'll see there were quite a few of them. Uh, the employment opportunity is actually one that's gone up some of the most. We've seen similar trends nationwide just as the economy continues to recover from the recession. Uh, but all in all, this county is doing much better, but it's still a high priority to residents as well. And you saw earlier, it was one of the areas that had one of the lower ratings still, even though you're making uh, good progress. And again, customer service, just how well your hand issues are handled, just again, want to commend your employees for providing the kind of customer service your residents expect. On the other hand, is some of the decrease uh, you'll see ease of travel and library children's programs were the two areas that decreased. The county fair was actually incorrectly labeled both here and on that previous chart. So it actually did not have a significant decrease from 2010. Last thing I want to share with you, at least with regard to some of the uh, satisfaction questions, is just priorities. One of the things that we took a look at, and in addition to rating folks, uh, having folks rate all the county services in different topical areas, we also add them rate the importance of those. And you notice of all the areas that were kind of rated in the category of living in the county, employment opportunities, crime prevention, educational facilities kind of rose to the top as being the issues that residents care the most about. You'll see courthouse facility at the other end, just 2%. Doesn't mean your courthouse isn't important, but when residents actually rate these items in the scheme, of everything they care about, it's not something that rises to the top of the list. And one of the tools that we put together on the next chart to kind of help you see where you might consider emphasizing your attention over the next couple of years as county leaders is what we've done here is we've plotted from left to right uh, the importance of each of these items. So you'll notice employment opportunities, crime prevention, educational facilities are to the fry right, courthouse facility to the left. Then as you go from the bottom to top, the things at the bottom are the areas that had the lowest satisfaction ratings, the things at the top had the highest satisfaction ratings, and what kind of stands out typically are those in the bottom right-hand quadrant. These are things that are more important on average where satisfaction is lower. These tend to be some of the areas you'll have the greatest impact on overall perceptions of residents when they look at the county if these areas improve. And right now you see employment opportunities is the area. Everything else is pretty much aligned where it 
should be. In fact, if you draw a straight line uh, from the left, bottom left to the top right, usually what you're hoping for is the things that are less important are those that are rated a little bit lower, and the things that are more important are the things you're doing the best in. And for the most part, the county's resources and just the overall way you're addressing some of these issues are aligned consistently with residents' expectations given the priority they place on each of these items. In addition, on the next chart, we asked about some other issues, particularly some of the services and aspects that affect quality of life. And you see it was a slightly different list, but in this case, economic development rose to the top of the list, suggesting that that theme of employment opportunities, the economy, uh, is really pervading people's thoughts at this point in time. It was followed by emergency preparedness, and then land use planning kind of rounded out the top uh, three. Uh, some of the other things that we learned on the survey, we looked at customer service ratings, and you'll notice this is what I mean by really great brand equity. You'll notice that all of the areas that were assessed, you had more than 60% of your residents give a rating of 8 or 9, which is phenomenal. Very little dissatisfaction. Frankly, you're always going to have some people that don't like the outcome uh, when they call a local government, but typically it tends to run more 25 to 30 percent with the average government. In this case, it's running anywhere from 13 to 17 percent. So very good ratings. In fact, on the next slide, you'll see how things have cha changed from 2010. And you'll see that the ease of contacting uh, your employees is up significantly. And you can see that how well issues are handled is also up significantly. And you can see some of the other areas stayed about the same. But remember, I showed you a little bit how you compare nationally. So in a couple areas, you've actually pushed the envelope even higher by setting what was a high rating the last time we did the survey to really creating a new standard, particularly when it comes to ease of contact and how well you're handling issues uh, that your residents might have. Uh, when you look at the, a couple of things related to communication, one thing it looks as more people are aware of your website than they were four years ago. It's gone from two out of three people uh, to three out of four. Uh, when you look at just perceptions of the opportunities to be involved in government, those have all increased. And you'll see everything from serving on citizen committees, public hearings, to public meetings, everything's seen an improvement from 2010. Still opportunities to do better, but you're certainly moving in the right direction. Uh, last couple things that we looked at uh, were some specific issues that I know you're looking at here. Just people's view on the amount of debt that's been issued by the county. And we actually asked folks kind of uh, a number of areas that they could rate. One in uh, five people just didn't have an opinion at all. But of those who did, you can see that one in seven or about 16% felt that you really have a financial challenge that has to be really addressed now. 43% felt that you it was necessary to keep up growth, some of the debt you've taken on, uh, but it still would be a financial challenge. 11% didn't think it was much of a financial challenge, and they thought it was ne necessary to keep up with growth. Then you see 10% not a financial challenge, and they thought maybe new debt would be necessary in the future. So you see if you look the 10 and 11% together, you kind of that almost balances out the 16% on the other side. So at the end of the day, your biggest response at 43%, I think your average resident thinks it was necessary to do that, but they think it's important that you be fiscally responsible as you move forward uh, on this issue. Um, in addition, we asked folks about the Cabarrus County Transportation Services, whether or not they thought it was important. Uh, you'll see that 62% thought it was very important. Another 20% uh, thought it was important. And you add in 13 that say somewhat important. You actually have over 90%. What's interesting about this is it's not that uncommon. Most people don't use the service. So oftentimes people think, well, you know, people are only going to think it's important if they use it. In this case, people probably view it as a necessary social service to have out there and or a way to get people to and from work who can't, other afford, uh, can't otherwise afford to do so. But clearly, uh, nearly two out of three thought it was very important, which was somewhat higher than we typically see. May I ask you a question? Yeah. On this? this one at the top, it says excluding don't knows. And uh -huh. I'm curious how many people responded don't know, because in the last slide that you had, I think you had 20% of the pie was don't know. Yeah, great question. Let me just say, probably can look it up for you here real quick. It's question number 24. Uh, we had 3%, so it wasn't a very high percentage. It was a total of 12 out of 406 people didn't know. So so many people, despite, I would suspect, you don't have a high, this level of usage, but still the perception of it being important is pretty wide throughout the county. 
Uh, just to kind of bring us back to where we started, uh, the conclusions, I think you can be pleased that residents generally have a good perception, not just of the county government, but as the county as a whole. And I think that shows that you're a very healthy place to live. I think the future is bright here. Uh, you're doing a great job delivering services. In fact, you're rated above the national average in pretty much every area that we assessed. Uh, satisfactions generally improved in many areas significantly since we started doing the survey back in 2008. But I think to continue moving forward in the direction that residents want uh, the county to move, you'll have to make sure you're able to address the employment opportunities and continue finding opportunities for economic development here. But all in all, I'd say you're moving in the right direction. So I don't know if anyone has any other questions, but I'd be more than happy uh, to answer them if there are. And we'll distribute the updated report later tonight. Did you only send this to registered voters? No, this was actually a random sample of all uh, residents. On page 19, it has question 8, did you vote in the last election in Cabarrus County? Right. And 78% of our respondents re re responded yes. Yeah. No, I don't think we had 78% of people in Cabarrus County vote. Um, so I, I, that seems like it's well. It's a, it's a one of the biases that's built in. People who just don't, you know, this is a survey is representative demographically, mm -hmm. but a survey like this, people who care about your local government tend to be a little more inclined to participate than those who don't. So the one bias is is this tends to be more re representative of your voting population than everybody else. But we included everybody, mm -hmm. so that way you can actually look if there are differences. So you can actually do a cross tab on that question to see if there's a differences between people who are registered to vote and those who aren't. And then the other question that I found interesting it is was on It was in page. March also. Yeah. yeah. So. I understand right. it wasn't this last election. Yeah. Um, Megan, if you could flip to page 16. Um, this is question 4B and it asks um, items most res items residents are willing to pay more for to avoid reductions in service and decrease quality. And really almost the majority of that was was none chosen right so what does that say to you in other words of the list uh, residents are most willing to pay more for to avoid reductions in service quality basically uh, it's hard to say exactly what the implication is for there you just had a significant number not choose any of the items but we didn't give them any outcomes for why not or why they feel that way you just did have a significant number that didn't pick anything and oftentimes that suggests that people are satisfied when you have high levels of satisfaction that they may not actually be that concerned about seeing service decreases or believe that it's real at this point in time okay well i, I think in cabarrus county that issue was really at yeah. the forefront and I, you could i think do you think it's fair to say you could make a conclusion from that that people don't want to pay more for those things? Probably have to do a little more. You know, I mean, it's one of the things we have the data. We're just kind of rolling it at now, and that's where if there's kind of some additional analysis and things like that, I've talked to Kasha that we can do some of that for you. One of the things that sometimes we'll do is actually identify what the profile is. In other words, of the people who said none, what do they look like? You know, so we might find that there's different characteristics of different types of respondents, and that's probably something we probably should do if that's something you're interested in doing. You don't have to do any more. Oh, okay, I was just okay, curious okay. about that. Thank sure. you. You said only 406 people completed this survey? Correct. Out of 180,000. Does that give you a good figure on what's really Absolutely. Going on? I've done uh, thousands. 400 people? 400 people. You don't have to sample all 100 and some thousand people well, to I know, know what that, they think. But, uh, 400 people, not very many out of 180,000. Well, it's a matter of doing random sampling. And uh, it's one of those things that in today's discussion, if you're, you're not comfortable, I can just tell you very, very confidently that it's an excellent sample. But it's not perfect. It's going to be right 95 times out of 100 within plus or five months plus or minus 5% margin of error. So in other words, if the actual answer is 50% and we get 55%, well, sometimes we'll be within that 95 times out of 100. And so that's the piece that I can give you a confident answer. Is it going to be perfect? No, there is some error in it. And the only way to avoid the error is to ask everyone, but the cost of getting input from everybody in the county is going to be quite high. And so given the cost effectiveness dollar per dollar to get a good indicator of what the general public thinks, this is a very, very good way to do it. What was the cost to get to 406? About $20,000. 1,200 people had the opportunity right. to participate. The, the other uh, 800 just didn't bother? Yeah. In fact, if we only had mailed it out and hadn't done aggressive phone calls, you would have probably only had about 120 people complete the survey. 
you know, one of the challenges today, like I said up front, is typically the only people you will ever hear from at these kind of meetings are going to be people who don't like what you're doing or want to change what you're doing. And without doing this kind of research, you frankly don't know what the average resident thinks. And this is probably one of the best ways to get it. It's not perfect, but it's an extremely accurate indicator for most of these issues that you're assessing. On the, <clears throat> the first page where you had the location of survey respondents, mm -hmm. um, does each dot represent one person or is it more than that? Not always. In other words, if someone, let's say we had a couple of people in the same apartment complex or just be one dot. Uh, mm -hmm. Other times, some people really don't want to give their exact address, so they'll give a nearby intersection. So if you had a couple of people who gave the same intersection, so it's not a perfect one for one. There are there is data for all of those so when we actually break it out and create the maps you know each right. area has a certain number of respondents uh, but each dot for the most part is one respondent but there certainly are some exceptions and some people didn't re didn't provide their frankly didn't even tell us where they lived and so oh, those, oh, those so are they have the option to tell you or not exactly right so. well I was looking particularly down in the lower right hand corner which which I would identify as the Midland area and I only see like eight dots down right. there and I noticed there were a couple of questions that that color on the map was different from the rest of the county yeah. and one of them was in our library services well and we're in the process of establishing a library in that area so I said well that's that yeah. makes sense uh, sure. and so that's why there and there may have been a couple other questions yeah. and, and I should probably just give an overview of those maps each of the shading isn't necessarily statistically representative for you know the county-wide the data is good but when you get into an area that's only has eight respondents that's not necessarily statistically representative so the maps are intended to give you sort of a guide for right. if there are differences but you should certainly take a look at other factors rather than just the survey responses before you decide whether you have good or bad service there just a, another tool to help you see it so if you have an initiative like you're discussing it might highlight that but if there's only eight respondents you know kind of take a look and make sure you don't make a decision just on the eight people so right. does that makes sense so well yeah it does yeah. make sense and, and I, I guess that could be a guide to say well if we see an area like that regardless of the number of yeah. respondents maybe we need to have a meeting in that area and, and give people another opportunity to express any concerns they might have so I, I see value in that regardless thank you I just have one question yeah. for you uh, the survey it was I'm assuming mailed to 1200 people is that correct correct okay and then the ones that were not did not respond we're given a phone call where did the 1200 addresses come from was that from our tax department or we, we actually purchased that list at random from uh, info USA it's one of the world's largest marketing list providers and a lot of people say well how do you get that they actually take all the different sources of address information everything from things that the county maintains that the US government maintains the credit cards and they actually put it together and probably give you the most accurate address up to date and their samples selected at random based on address so essentially every residential address in the county was eligible to be selected and then we picked the 1200 records from there we then appended the known phone number to that so it included both landlines and cell phones so that way we could reach people uh, who don't uh, have a landline in their house anymore okay. and one of the reasons we liked ETC <coughs> Institute was that they went by address rather than phone because so many of us have cell phones that are associated right. with where we grew up or a right. place that we lived yeah. in our lives okay all right, that's that's the only question I have. I do have one more question, and this is just a general question. But if you've got, I think in our last election we had 13 percent of people voted, and this survey responded 78 percent of people voted. And you had talked about the fact that there are sort of an inherent bias in it. Um, you, how do you take? As you had mentioned, somebody that's going to take the time to spend 15 minutes obviously cares. And they care, it seems like, to a much greater degree than the average citizen. So how do you assign their opinion to the, to really the greater than average citizen? I mean, if you take 87% of our population didn't vote and 13% did, and so you're basically using the 13%'s opinion as to things to uh, extrapolate data on the 87%. And that, 
uh, that just is interesting yeah, to me more than anything. It's different. Your local elections, you know, whether they're for a school, county, city, they tend to be smaller uh, turnout. That's something we do know. Uh, from the survey, when it was administered, oftentimes what happens is people aren't even aware that there was a small, or, you know, county election. So for in this case, since we had a presidential election in the last couple of years, a lot of people, when they say, did you vote in the last election, there are pro many people. So this is probably really more reflective of the registered voter, not necessarily who voted in which election if you look at the data in that way so yeah I um, think even in presidential elections though it's, it's going to be more about it's going to but what, it, what I'm saying is you probably have about 80 percent of the folks who responded to this survey who are registered to vote whether or not they all voted in your last I know you had an election in March but uh, I don't think you can use the survey results necessarily to predict is that I guess I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question I'm maybe. just curious about um, so even in a presidential election, mm -hmm. you're probably going to have maybe 35 percent of people vote, something uh -huh. like that. So you're still using the minority's opinions yeah. to extrapolate data based on a much stronger majority. And I was just curious about how you would do that. Well, in some communities, we intentionally oversample people who aren't registered to vote. But the costs of doing that are high. In this case, you've got 20 percent of your respondents or about 80 folks, which is a statistically valid sample. So if you actually want to see are there differences between people who didn't vote in the county and those who do, this sample is large enough for you to do that. So for the purposes of this study, I think that your sample is big enough and your methodology is sound. However, if you're trying to figure out, well, how do you get people to register to vote who aren't, you probably would increase the sample size and do a more uh, thorough follow-up. You know, in other words, you'd over, what we do call oversampling. We actually target certain types of people who are less responsive to find out. But that would probably, the rationale for doing that would probably be different than your rationale for doing the survey as you've done at this time. But that could be done, and we certainly do that kind of work. Thank you. I was just curious. Sure. sure. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you Appreciate all. you coming to do the presentation. Yeah, um, we'll Kasha, is this going to be on the website? Yes, we'll post information on the survey under hot topics. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have Humane Society of Concord in Greater Cabarrus County. Hello. Hello. Do you want to talk about this too? Or? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Sims in to give you an annual report. You have it and we've had it uh, out in the packet, but wanted uh, Ms. Sims to have the opportunity to see you guys face to face, tell you how it's going, tell you about the good stuff that, that they are doing. Uh, the Chief Hunt's back there as well and he can verify it from the Sheriff's Department side if you need him to do that as well. Uh, but we're excited they're here. They're, like I said, they're, they're doing really good things uh, in the county and we're excited that we're, we're able to move forward for another year. So. With that, we'll pass it on to you. Hello. Well, <clears throat> we are very excited. It, it hardly seems possible that it's been two years since we started this partnership. And um, I am very happy to say that it's been very successful. And um, we have had um, some challenges, but they've not been that many. And we've been able to overcome them. And um, I'm our partnerships have have been awesome we've reached out way out into the community and out through the United States with rescues um, June 30th will actually mark the end of the first two-year partnership and this partnership has certainly has certainly strengthened our position in the community within with animals with the residents and with what we the Humane Society are able to do to help people with their personal pets and to help find homes for the strays and to help match lost pets back up with their owners through things we have done with animal control and with the way we worked with the sheriff, sheriff's department and with our rescue coordinator that we've been able to bring on board full time. So um, we have made major strides out at animal control with what we've been able to do. and. Um, I think you'll see as we move forward through this that we have been able to realize our goal of reducing euthanasia rates over the past two years significantly. And we've been able to do that um, by several methods. One of the things that we've been able to do is we now proactively vaccinate all puppies, um, kittens, and all adoptable animals that come in through our doors. If we deem that they are adoptable, we vaccinate them on intake, which helps us to eliminate the spread of diseases that in the past may as soon as they walk in the door they're susceptible to that so we are able to vaccinate them and that's something that we've wanted to do for a long time 
And as I said before, we have a full-time rescue coordinator who is at the shelter every single day. Let me also add that, like myself and about 20 other people that work every day there, she is um, a full-time volunteer. And she is able to move probably you know, 50 animals out of there within every two-week span into rescues, and we've not been able to do that in the past. She is at that shelter every single day. She is a single mother, and I mean, it's awesome watching her work you know, at the shelter, and she works miracles sometimes. We have to call on her to work magic for us, and she does that. I have a couple of slides that I'm going to put up in just a second. One of the slides represents numbers of animals that come in through animal control and represents the ones that the Humane Society actually takes. And the second slide will represent the ones that, how the numbers of animals that are actually euthanized has decreased over the past two years since we've started um, control of the shelter. And I want you to take a good look at that because it, it represents how hard we actually have worked. This particular slide just actually shows the number of animals that have come in, cats and dogs that have come in, and the numbers, the percentage of animals that we have actually taken. Just, this is calendar year 2013. But the next slide is the one I'm particularly proud of. If you look at the euthanasia rates, this is, these are the ones, the remaining animals after rescues have pulled, after we have pulled, and the ones that have been reclaimed by their owners. And if you notice between 2012, when we moved in and started working actively to move more animals out and to kind of, you know, use all the resources available to us, that the euthanasia rates went down significantly. There are a lot of there are a lot of things that actually affect these numbers, but this kind of gives you a picture of you know how effective we can be when we are able to, you know, use a lot of resources that we have available to us. couple of ways that we make this happen is by using local rescues. I'm not sure if how aware everyone is of some of the newer rescues that are being formed within the community. And of course, we always start at home looking to the new rescues that are formed and working within our own community because we certainly like to, you know, we, we like to work together as, you know, Cabarrus County is very close-knit and tightly bonded and we like to take advantage of that and form a partnership with those around us. We also move a lot of animals out into you know, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. We've moved a lot of animals up to New York using transports. We have a lot of great people willing to help us. We get a lot of sponsorships from South Carolina. We have a lot of rescues who will sponsor animals and help us transport. And then we have a lot of local volunteers who will actually transport for us. So that's been very effective for us. One of the things that we're particularly proud of is the fact that we now have a camera set up in the back of animal control, thanks to Todd, so we can take, the animal control officers can take photographs of the animals as they are being brought in by animal control and they go up on a website, which is also new, and that allows people who are missing their animals to go out on the website and see if their animal is actually there. So that's helping to boost animals that are reclaimed you know, by their owners. So we're very proud of that, the lost and found. We're also offering at the county shelter a monthly rabies clinic, um, and that's growing in popularity, so we're proud of that. The other thing that Mike has allowed us to do is to install our exercise yard so that the animals can get out and exercise, making them more adoptable so when folks come in to see them, they're not pent up and, you know, from being in those kennels all day. So I asked if we could put that in, and he worked his magic, and so now we have that. And within the next couple of weeks, we're going to be able to put covers over them so that they can be outside, you know, during the, you know, when the sun's out. Other things are <clears throat> working with Lieutenant Taylor to create a standard operating procedure. The um, Department of Agriculture, who mandates us, required that we do this so that there is actually a procedure when an animal comes in, how, you know, how we manage that for after hours if one is ill or has been injured, and the animal control officers follow that. It works. Our process works. It works great, and so that helps us to manage animals so that they do not have to suffer you know, in the off hours. So we have formed a partnership with Mount Pleasant Animal Hospital, so if an animal is suffering or injured after hours, we take it you know, to Mount Pleasant, and they take care of that for us so that no one has to suffer unnecessarily. The other thing is the Humane Society now has a certified rabies vaccinator and a humane euthanasia technician for emergencies only. 
And that just happens to be me in both cases, just because there was nobody else who was willing or able to do it. So, and the reason we did that was because it just helps to move things along quickly in the, in the back of the house. Now, I will say that I was requested by the state to become a euthanasia technician. I, I don't do it, but someone had to be trained just for an extreme emergency, and they needed somebody who was willing to step up and do that, and was not something that I wanted to do, but was something that I was asked to do by our state inspector. So by, um, I guess I was kind of encouraged to do it, so I did it. So. Um, and also, um, when I sat here before, we had a list of goals that we had set forward for our next two years, and all of those goals and attention areas from two years ago have been met. So um, we have been able to, the camera was one of those things, the rescue coordinator was one of those things, and in our opinion, and I believe, you know, when working with Lieutenant Taylor, this partnership has been very successful, and the animals of Cabarrus County and the people that we're able to match back up with their animals has been very, very successful. And we, the Humane Society, is particularly very proud of this partnership. Well, I want to say that um, you've, I think you're the one that's been working miracles, and you need to take credit for that because when when this partnership started I think there were a number of, of different entities that you know weren't completely on board and um, it was a leap of faith for a lot of people for what you've done and you've proven everybody that that it was a great choice for us to go into with you and um, you and Mike have just really it, exceeded all expectations I think and and you deserve the credit for it the Humane Society but you you specifically deserve credit because you really have worked hard and um, as a animal lover I, I want to make sure you know that we appreciate everything that you've done so well, thank you it, it's, um, it, it's, it's phenomenal a, it's an it's a great group of volunteers it's it's not it's not me it's you know I, I'm the head of the organization but I gotta say we have a great group of volunteers. It's a great team, and we all work together, moving toward a common goal. And I knew we could do it. I felt, I felt strongly that we could do it and be successful, and I, I want us to continue to move forward and to make great strides with the animals in Cabarrus County because it's very important. But thank you very much. Well, I agree you have a team of volunteers, but you have to have somebody with the vision and with the plan to be able to execute and to organize volunteers, which sometimes harder to organize volunteers than it is to organize somebody that's on a payroll. So um, that's why I think that you you. you deserve all you deserve a lot of credit. How's Thank that? you very much. Okay, commissioners. Anybody else want to add a comment or any questions that you have? I had one question. You were talking about the first of all. Thank you for volunteering and for everything that you do. Uh, you were talking about relocating animals to New York. Why would we do that? I mean, why, well, why would there be a demand there? A <clears throat> couple of reasons. The first thing is, there, in, in New York, they do not have enough adoptable animals in certain areas. So they look to us, to some of the southern states, to provide animals. In Cabarrus County, there are so many animals that come into our shelters we don't have enough rescues to take them. So to avoid, our choices would be to euthanize them or you know, move them out into other rescues. And so the, when you, the next day is put down day and you're, you have some great adoptable animals, you start looking outside of, you know, of our area mm -hmm. and you have states that are looking for them and willing to pay you know, their vetting fees and you know, the health certificate fees. So you look to a place, of the you know, the great rescues that qualified rescues who are willing to take them. A lot of them are animals like pit bulls that we get, our, our shelter is full of pit bulls. And they are highly adoptable. They have a bad rep, I mean, you know, they have a bad reputation in, in a lot of different areas. Some of it's deserved, some of it's not. So if <coughs> we're able to take an adoptable animal that we don't have space for, we don't have a rescue for, and move it, you know, up north to a place where they don't have a lot of animals, then you know we'll make you know whatever strides to get that you know to happen, and you know it just happens to be that up north is is a great need for them. Right. So, well, thank thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I was just curious. 
why the demand I wish be. we didn't have to do it, but then the same goes for Maryland and kittens. We move kittens to Maryland all the time. Really? Mm -hmm. yeah, but they have a huge demand for them and, and can't get them, so, you know, we, and we have plenty of them, so come on down. So. <laughs> well, it's nice that we have that option available to us. Thank you. What are some of the new rescue groups that you had mentioned that were recently formed? We have it, Forever Friends is one that we work with, and we work with Cabarrus Animal Rescue. It's one of the new ones within the last couple of years. Um, there's a new one called, it's, it's a kitten rescue called Kitten Love, I think, it's, or something like that. Um, and there are two new puppy rescue organizations that have recently formed. I'm not familiar with, I can't remember their names right off the top of, right off the top of my head, but um, another one is um, in Matthews that pulls from us. They've just recently started pulling from us. Um, there's uh, one in Rock Hill called um, Jessie's Place that pulls from us, and she pulls probably maybe 60% of the labs that, that we can't place, black labs, and you know, black dogs are like ad adopt or are like purchasing a yellow car. Nobody wants it, and so she pulls about sixty percent of the ones that would be euthanized. Yeah, some rescues um, are breed specific. Just you know, they really like take your pick cocker spaniels, and that's all they really want to deal in. And so, one community can't support enough rescues for all the different breeds and so you end up with some like that and I used to help adopt out greyhounds and um, they would come from Alabama and we would keep them until um, there was a lady that was the one who actually vetted the clients and everything because they're very unique um, and unique dogs I shouldn't say very but they, they are because of how they're they're trained and uh, what we would keep them for however long we needed to until they could um, you know find homes for them in the area so um, and we had a couple of them um, that a number of them that we that we helped adopt out but you got to find somebody that's willing to take care of them and feed them in order to find in order to place them and um, um, for a greyhound for example um, they're they're really fast but they don't run very long so we we had we had a couple of them and they when you let them run take them off leash they'll fly but then it's like okay I'm tired I've done that. My Jack Russell would sit there and do this and just watch ours run. And then she'd get tired and then he'd take off and run around her and act crazy. So, um, but a lot of them are very breed specific. So. Any other questions? Sorry, I don't know, you're, you're grinning so I know you're thinking about something. But um, uh, Greyhounds and Jack Russells were, were mine. Now I have a 104 pound blonde lab that's my daughter's that apparently isn't going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> but that's a different story. So. Um, thank you very much. We thank seriously you. really do appreciate all your hard work because you've, you've turned that area around that we used to get a lot of phone calls about into, and made it a very positive relationship and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, Lundy is going to come up. Oh, wait, there you are, sorry. And we have a compensation study results. Good afternoon. Actually, this is a follow-up to the information that was initially presented at the May 5th work session. So we've asked Mr. Robertson to come back, and now that you've had a chance, hopefully, to review his draft report to answer any questions you may have. So at this point, do you want to do just an initial reintroduction? Uh, starting it out with questions will be fine. Okay. Were there any questions then after reviewing the information? Where does Cabarrus County rate in the in the process of all these counties? You mean on your your pay plan? Yeah. Uh, the Top, minimum bottom, of the middle minimum of the pay plan is about two point I think six percent above the average in the market. Cabarrus County it is. Yes, sir. Okay. Remember what you're looking at on a market study though is your pay plan and not the salaries of your employees. Yeah. It's just the structure of your pay plan.
Well, I'll just say I, I, I need a little bit more time to look through this. We've been Tuesday and Thursday of last week. We were in the middle of five-hour budget meetings, and, and we're going to do another one tonight. And um, I, so I, I need a little bit more time to look through this. Yeah, I just just add to it. Last time you were presented with um, that, the study showed that, as as Mr. Robinson just said, our salaries are somewhere in the range overall about 2.6. So we're not asking for the, any adjustments other than those two departments. And while we have the experts here, if you have had an opportunity, if any of you had any other questions, just concerning those two, the administrative positions that we were trying to correct throughout the county as a result of um, a large part, part of that as, was as a result of combining or consolidating human services or DSS, which were state employees at the time, into the county to try to come up with uh, um, titles that match for all of our administrative or clerical personnel along with their salaries to make sure that if they're doing the same jobs, they're called the same thing and they, they are receiving equal uh, compensation for those uh, duties and then of course uh, the remainder of the General Services Administration so while they're here if you have any questions if you don't have them tonight if you need more time then you know just please shoot those to us pretty quickly and we'll make sure that Mr. Robertson gets them and we'll get those back to you in writing. Thank you. 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 Thank
so this is at the bottom of the map here is Stallings Road and then you can see the access into the elementary school itself um, to the north side of this or just on the northern edge of this map are five <coughs> privately owned parcels um, referred to as the Doster property uh, those parcels are currently accessed from Highway 49 and have a crossing over the rail to access them uh, at, at grade level. And what NCDOT wants to do is close that crossing. So we looked at two options over time, and one was a connection from those properties to the parking area of Harrisburg Elementary. The difficulty with that is the stacking and congestion that occurs in the morning and afternoon. There would be times when the property owners here would not be able to exit. Um, they looked at adding some additional lanes. Um, none of that seemed to alleviate the problem that there would be times they would not be able to go in and out of their property. So currently there's an access road on the back side of Harrisburg's Park um, that is used to get to this well pump station or a well lot. Um, it is also used in part to a drive that goes up through the middle of the ball fields um, and then accesses a <coughs> maintenance building. What NCDOT has proposed to do is to build a new road or to extend this road, it's already gravel, but to improve it so that it's paved up to the point of the well lot and then a gravel road that extends up to the Doster property. In addition, um, through discussions with the, with the schools when we met out there, they've agreed to build a gravel emergency access road to the back side of the school to provide, in, in cases of an emergency, a secondary way to ingress and egress from this school property. Um, we w came back to them after some discussion, the county and the town of Harrisburg, about two issues. One was what portion of this would be maintained publicly. Harrisburg has agreed, because they use this maintenance building on the back side of the park complex, they have agreed to maintain to that point. So that was one issue that has been addressed. And the private property owners, the Dosters, I believe, are amenable to maintaining the remaining portion that accesses their property. And then, of course, the schools would maintain that section that, that provides the emergency access. Um, but we also went back to them because it was only paved to the point of the well lot and asked them for a difference in cost to pave the remainder of that for long-term maintenance costs. Um, they have agreed that, that is, it's possible. The price tag for that is approximately $60,000, and they've asked both the town of Harrisburg and Cabarrus County to participate at, at a level of $10,000 for the county. Um, and also for the town of Harrisburg. The town has agreed to the maintenance portion of it, but has not agreed to participate in the cost of the project. So I did want to disclose that. That's happened since I prepared the agenda item. So the town has, well, they're open to maintaining that, that new road um, from what will be a gate at Stallings <coughs> Road up to that point. Um, they, they did not want to participate in any additional paving at this point. Um, so it really would just be a case of whether the county wants to participate. That would be something that I would suggest could come from your contingency if you're open to that. Um, otherwise, I would just report to them that you do not wish to participate. And then finally, I did want to make one disclosure. There are five properties in here, um, some outbuildings, but three dwelling units. Um, one of those dwelling units is a county employee, one of our um, electrical inspectors. So I did want to make it clear that there is actually a county employee who's one of the people that would be accessing through this new road. It currently accesses from that private crossing. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, so just to clarify, um, DOT is going to pay a third of the way. So DOT will, will to is going to pay building. for all the initial improvements would be a, a paved road from Stallings Road, well, a gate, paved road from Stallings Road to this well lot and then a new gravel road from that point up to the Doster property and to the back side of the school property. So DOT's doing all of that? That's right. And the additional okay. cost to pave all of that, and it would only be a single lane width, is $60,000, and they're requesting the county to participate at a level of $10,000 to pave the remainder of that from that well lot to the edge of the Doster property. From that point, once it's constructed, from that point forward, the town of Harrisburg will maintain the road up to the maintenance building, and the Doster family would be responsible for that paved portion beyond the maintenance building, and the school's responsible for the gravel road that access the back side of the school. Okay, so that was my next question. The part going to the school will, is gravel for sure? It is. Okay. Um, you said there's a gate on Stallings Road? There would so be a gate, because this is a... How is that accessible from... Yeah 
park's point of view, the school's point of view, if they had to do an emergency exit from there, and the family, how's that gate going to work? So that may be something Bobby could give you a more technical answer to. Essentially, that's a, a there's a there's a lock there that that the parks and the Harrisburg parks um, <coughs> and there may and Harrisburg maintenance as well as the Doster family would have access to. But there's also a, a Knox box, so an emergency method to unlock that and open it should they have to get emergency vehicles down there. So there's a way for the fire, EMS, sheriff all to access that also. So really only be open to the maintenance crews, the families, and emergency providers. Um, because those are such active ball fields, they do not want parking. There's not room for parking there. So the reason for the gate is really to prevent additional parking on that backside. So when, when the family members exit, is they'll have to get out of their car, open the gate, pull out, close the gate. I believe it's going to be electronic, so they won't have to okay. get in and out of their car. That was because I was thinking, where's the gate going to be, and, and what happens if somebody comes to a ball game and block parks in front of the gate, even though you know there'll be a no parking sign on it, I presume. Mm -hmm. There will and be. And then they would block it, and then they wouldn't be able to get out, and there's not, I mean, technically they could come out, and I guess they can backtrack to the school if yeah. they had to, but that would be very annoying if you were in and out because it was your residence. Yeah. And I believe that will also be gated. So the Harrisburg, the, their office for their parks and recreation is right here. And that was an issue we discussed on site was, was making sure that it was not blocked because it, it would be their access for their maintenance vehicles, which right now, one of the things is that their maintenance vehicles are coming to this point at the well lot. And then if they need to get to that maintenance building, they're currently going up between the ball fields near the scoring and concessions and then to their maintenance building that direction. This would actually allow them to go on the back side of that. So in, not surprisingly, that is an extremely popular um, athletic facility between Harrisburg and the, the athletic fields that were developed as part of the school park concept. Yeah, that one's all usually in pretty big demand. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Just had a question. Jonathan, the current access that's coming off of Highway 49 mm -hmm. for the private residence, is that paved or is that gravel? It's I gravel. It is gravel. Yeah. And one of their issues is that's been, that's been established. That has been there 50 plus years from my understanding. It has a very solid gravel base, including the access that, at the, which is right on the edge of this map and difficult to see, that accesses their houses. This is going to be a completely new road bed and new gravel. So there's a concern in particular about the initial maintenance costs those first few years until that gravel bed is established, which was one of the reasons that the paving from the well lot to the maintenance building, which is going to have the, the greatest amount of traffic on it, it was important. We felt to have that paved and then the family was wanted to have the remainder of that paved for the same reason. Jonathan, did you say they're going to lose their access into the school parking lot or that they will be able to retain that for most of the time, except sometime it will be blocked? Um, the main access is, will remain open all the time, but the that emergency access from here, I, I believe they will block. Um, I, I'm talking about for the resident. Oh, the residents currently do not have access into that parking lot. That was a, an alternative we discussed. Okay because um, it was a much shorter distance to do the same thing to provide a gate and actually come in somewhere in this drive um, but I think after observing both drop off and pick up and, and watching that they felt like they weren't going to be able to go in and out of their home so they're going to lose their current access then completely they will lose their current access from 49 completely and they do own the parcel to the other side of the railroad track or the family does so that um, that is more of a commercial parcel when you start looking at the land use pattern that would no longer have that access drive going through it. You mentioned the cost being 60000 and our contribution would be ten. Mm -hmm. What is the breakdown of the other contributions? Well, the majority of this cost is all coming through the, and there's really two projects here. The, the larger double tracking project is one funding source. The private road crossing closure is a second funding source that is, is federal and state money going to pay for that. So the majority of all this cost is coming through federal and state monies to close those private crossings. Um, the $60,000 that we're discussing is just the additional cost for that, that paving that we've discussed. Right. But, so we would contribute 10, where would and the other 50,000? From North Carolina DOT would contribute that 50,000. Okay. Yeah. But you had mentioned that the town of Harrisburg was not willing to contribute. So 
were they going to contribute ten thousand as well? Or they were, they were asked to, and they have declined because of they because they foresee the long term maintenance cost for this primarily. I think they and and perhaps Mr. Cook, I don't know if you were there for that discussion, but I think that was the bigger issue, at least communicated to me, was their long term maintenance cost was already a contribution. I was actually not part of that. Okay, session, so. all right. I may have been one of their budget workshops. Would, would their maintenance cost not, not be much less if it's paid? I, I think their maintenance cost will be less if it's paid, particularly in that area where the new road bed is because because it's going to take a while for the gravel to set. You're going to have a, a, a higher cost initially to to keep that road up. What happens if the county don't put up 10000 um, I will communicate that to North Carolina DOT and they'll have to make a decision whether or not they, they want to absorb the entire cost or whether or not they'll simply pave to that well lot and then gravel the rest. Looks like they'd go ahead and pay for it. It's their fault it's been done, right? It's for them. Yes, sir. That was the argument that I made to them about doing this in the first place. Steve or Jason, do you have anything else? Any questions? Well, I, th I think my <clears throat> questions have been answered. I, I too, was curious. Um, this really is nothing we've had anything to do with or had any involvement with it does not it, it really it has not we've been participating because it involved um, the Board of Education property so mr. Whitkey and mr. Burnett um, right. to some extent mr. Burnett since mr. Whitkey is has retired um, we began participating because it was accessing that publicly owned property Right. And, and trying to act really as a go-between and solve the issue because they really weren't making any headway in getting this closed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been our biggest involvement. But it is overall the public benefit is the fact that they're willing to do that secondary access to the, the school. And that, that already is being completely funded by DOT. So there is a, a benefit, a public benefit to this project that's being funded by DOT, which is that gravel spur, which they've continued to agree to do. So if we agreed to fund a portion of the paving, that would make that a little more accessible or, or knowing that that would be improper because this is not only going to be used in case of emergencies, right? That's right. That so there would be, it. it would make more of the road that, that provided that emergency access. The part that's traveled regularly would be paved. Um, so more of that would be paved. And then we would still gain the benefit of having that gravel drive, which is right. we will have anyway. Right. Which that makes a little bit more sense that we might want to participate. Thank you. Jason, do you have anything else? Okay. Okay, Chris, you good? Okay, I thought you just make it sure. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Okay, next, Pam Dubois uh, for 4.3. Okay, based on the board action on May 27th, uh, this uh, agenda item is to start the proposed funding for the Kannapolis Middle School project. Uh, on March 17th, the, uh, the board voted to allow Kannapolis to withdraw their bond resolution, and they did so. And on May 27th, the bond figures were put into place, and Kannapolis is not included in that. So this, uh, like I said, this item will start that bond process. If you'll go to... to two sheets past this you will see the schedule for, from Kannapolis City Schools the architect put a timeline together in relationship to what it would take to get this proposed project in the uh, bond document uh, bid documents together and in order to get and meet most likely the March deadline of what we had in our five-year plans we need to proceed with this as far as in the month of June to start the financing of it that's about a seven month process to get the architect and engineering um, scheduled together and then the bid awards and the bidding process is about a two to three month process it's a 10 month cycle and that would get us to March of next year April if, at the latest so uh, we're proposing to take the funding from uh, two of the assignments that were released when the uh, workers compensation uh, fund was stabilized at the last meeting uh, that released one million nineteen thousand dollars of uh, assignment and then there was a three hundred thousand dollar assignment for environmental 
which was for the landfill, and so that's 1,319,000. I spoke with Mr. Crabtree from Kannapolis City Schools, and that was enough money to start the architectural process. We will need to get the remainder of the money to them, but that would be for the phase of construction of the actual project, so it would not be necessary to get it to them immediately, and we could be able to do that after we close the books <coughs> and come up with uh, the true assessed excess fund balance. So this item is before you to start that uh, financing project and to get the architect money into Kannapolis's hands so they can start their design uh, of the facility. Okay, questions, commissioners? And the second schedule behind this is the actual whole financing schedule. The next page. Um, I had asked at the last meeting what our surplus would be for the year, and um, I think they were going to get that for me, so maybe now we will have Part of them, I thought, made copies to pass out. Yeah. I'm Is sorry. he still I, here? You were supposed to already have it at your table, so. Where is it? Yeah, he was making copies prior to the meeting. Here he comes. There he is. <laughs> he had prepared uh, the questions that you had asked and responses for all the uh, budget questions that had been asked thus far and that projection that uh, Ms. Wilson had told you she'd be presenting to you. Perfect timing. And can you come up here and show them where your projection is in this packet? Well, maybe I can just ask. I, I think at our last, the last update we had, I think it had gone from 3.3 at the end of January to 5.5 in March. Are you expecting it to be more than 5.5 now? Do you have a ballpark of what you expect it to be? Yeah, we are expecting it to be higher. We'll have the breakdown here for you. So. Okay, 
in your budget book when we presented where we thought we'd be on page 110. We thought the excess would be $10,856,189. Um, tonight we're going to talk about a million and a half that Rowan Cabarrus Community College needs before um, we close out the audit and everything because they have a bid that's, that expires July 2nd. So that will be before you tonight. That's why kind of, this is a little ahead of where we are. And then the million three nineteen that Mr. Bois just mentioned uh, relating to the Canapolis architect and engineering. So that would bring it down to eight million thirty seven thousand one eighty nine. Um, since the last since the budget book went out, I've continued to revise estimates and we expect an increase in receipts, primarily vehicle revenues for this year of seven ninety four five ninety. And um, some, some of the expenses, I think, will be a little less than my original projection, by 34809 So right now, the estimate is $8,866,588. So our gross estimate is $10.85 million for our surplus for the year. Yes. And that was inclusive of the assignments that were released also yes well that that that's including the, the release of the assignments well as it pertains to Kannapolis City Schools I don't think we have any problem funding their architecture at um, 1.3 million and that money's actually sitting in fund balance as we release it from assignments and that's why we were putting that funding together along with the 1.5 million the money is actually there until the books are actually closed we prefer not to transfer excess fund balance so we went with safe safe solutions at this point and then be able to do the rest once the books were closed okay are there any other questions or comments concerning um, proposed funding for Canapolis Middle School I think the rest of this you're going to talk about when at the end when we do more budget comments okay. okay thank you Ann okay if there's nothing else on that uh, let's move to 4.4 uh, new Northwest area elementary school is that you or that's the Kelly Klutz is here to talk about that. Good afternoon. We um, have a budget request, a budget amendment request to move um, from several line items. And if you would just move down to the next one, please. I think it shows a, a snapshot. Um, so we put this budget together. Um, many months ago and the the line item detail that was submitted to you was is very detailed we'd like to get away from that but but for the purpose of closing our books um, we need to get um, the budgets approved as they are um, so right now we know that we currently have um, an architect contract that um, that is this amount so we need to get that in line we also know that our engineering contract that we're looking into is is uh, more projected to be the amount that that we're showing there and in addition the land that we're um, going to purchase is more in line with the the dollar amount that you have there um, we have contingency amount um, budgeted and certainly it would use most of that to um, to take care of those balances and we'll uh, Dave and I will address any questions that you have Commissioners, any questions? My only question is on the timing of the school. When we were brought the three resolutions in January, it was imperative that we acted on them immediately because the school was going to be uh, rushed through and opened by the fall of next year. And now we're coming up five months past that, and we haven't even done engineering contracts, and there's no hope of meeting that. And I feel like um, we did not get the complete picture when those three re resolutions were brought to us with immediate need. We had several special meetings to deal with them and things like that. And um, 
it doesn't appear as though there was the time urgency that was necessary uh, or, or that was implied to us that was necessary. That was the goal at the time. A lot of things have changed since then. A lot of decisions were made at the time. Um, a view, uh, um, different views of how we were going to use the school. Um, we were scrutinized um, very heavily for the amount of dollars that we were putting into the school. So we went back and looked at it over and over and over again, um, managed those decisions through that process. Um, different things were, were looked at. Um, it took longer to do that. Um, and we came to different resolutions and, and those took uh, a longer period of time. Um, so we're not at the same place that we started when we came to you. And um, hindsight is twenty twenty. I wish we knew everything that we knew when we started out, but simply said, we, we learned as we went along and we changed our decision path. Well, I, I find that the school board continues to bring stuff to us with a very definitive set of plans, and then we act on that, and it turns out that there wasn't, it was represented to us that it was very definitive, but in actuality, there was uh, not very much definiteness to it at all. And um, it, for Mount Pleasant Middle School is a perfect example of that. This one's a great example of that. We keep getting these requests, and we're told, don't ask us questions, we know what we're doing, and at the end of the day, it turns out that the things that you've told us haven't been exactly accurate, and um, I it's think very difficult to manage budgetary decisions when we're given information like that. I think those are extremely broad statements, and I think those are things that you need to talk with our board chair about. We're here um, to ask for a budget amendment, and I'll take back your, your questions and concerns. Um, am I correct that you're not asking for any additional money? You're asking to move from what was in your contingency out of contingency to cover these three areas? That's correct. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Ann. You are up for the next one. Public safety radio replacements and chiller replacements. Okay. Um, <clears throat> at our next meeting, a lot of things happen in June. It's a big month. We will be approving, uh, hopefully, our fiscal 15 budget. And in that budget, um, we have certain items that will be transferring from the general fund to the capital improvement fund. And, um, or the construction renovation fund and what this is doing um, with the regular budget ordinance you will be appropriating funds from the general fund this is the other side if, if, if you will one's throwing a catch and the other one's throwing a ball and the other's catching it where we've got the general fund saying I'm providing funds over here and this is for the other fund to say I've got these funds and now put them in the in the project fund so the items from the general fund to the uh, construction renovation fund are 165,000 for the governmental ch center chiller and si 672,000 for public safety radio replacements that was year one of a three-year three-year purchase and so what this would do is is do that side of the entry it kind of goes in in tandem with the budget ordinance Okay. Any questions? Now, later on tonight, we may, you know, and obviously in the budget process, we may change something, but basically whatever we do from the general fund to the other funds, it has to, needs to match up. So ju just to make, these are things that have already been included. We're just shifting them around to get them in the right place. These are two items that are in the FY15 general fund budget. <coughs> right. That are proposed to be, that those will be transfers to the capital and renovation construction and renovation to be spent from there so that would need to be done after the budget was approved technically technically okay. but I think I think it'll all happen at the June meeting right okay thank you typically any projects that we fund from general fund resources that are for a capital project type thing where it takes multiple months to complete it we do not keep those in the general fund we move those over to the CI the capital project funds and maintain them in there because some of them cross fiscal years most likely the radio replacement will cross over fiscal years so we transfer it to a multi-year fund so we can keep track of it 
Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Ann. Mm -hmm. And you have the next one. Um, right. The next one is the one we've talked briefly about, which is the Rowan Cabarrus Community College, million and a half. Um, it was brought to our attention that they have a bid that expires July the 2nd. And so um, they would like for us to fund this million and a half for the cosmetology move soon, in June. Um, and so what we uh, have, have been able to do is to, now that it's this late in the year, we know we have some ex revenues that are over budget. And so if you'll notice the budget amendment is, is, is budgeting more in the property tax by 881,945, more in the vehicle tax delinquent collections of 172,658, some more vehicle tax interest of 4,987, and the Medicaid hold harmless that previously had not been budgeted of 44410. So that adds up to a million and a half from which then we can uh, 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 allocate the, the me those increase in revenues would afford us the expense to contribute a million and a half to Rowan Cabarrus Community College from our general fund. Okay, commissioners, questions concerning these? So, as my understanding would be, all of these funds are, are available now. They're sitting there, so it's just a yes, matter of they are over-realized receipts as right. we speak. They're not projections. They are actual receipts. Okay. Yes. Commissioners? Chairman Poole, I, I suspect we'll all just approve this, and I think it'll be on the um, consent agenda. So I, I will say now that, um, you know, I'd like to point out to the people of Cabarrus County, we, we represent you. Um, we are here to tell you about things that are going on. And Larry, Chris, and myself won't be here anymore after a little while, but I'm going to sort of clue you in on to some things. Remember back in March when we funded those schools with cash, Commissioner Morris, you lied to the newspaper and told them we wouldn't have the money to pay for the, for the salary increases, and then we did. And RCC immediately came in here. I think you sit on the board of RCCC, don't you, Commissioner Morris? Came in here with that resolution that said there's a crisis. You've allocated away all of our money, and you've got to resolve this crisis. And here we have $10.8 million in surplus, and we're going to go ahead and fund this. Um, folks, you've got to see it time and time again. The people that want to grow government are going to tell you every time somebody comes in and brings any sort of accountability that there is going to be a crisis. And until we start to see these things and start to th see the means of how government operates, we are going to fall victim to these things time and time again. Well, I'm just going to say I didn't think there was a crisis at the time. Um, but there, we had not. I, no, I agree. I'm, I'm not. Their resolution with what you said. specifically stated that there is a crisis that we needed to resolve. And no, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. At that time, I didn't feel there was a crisis. We just had not allocated the actual money, and that's what this does. Um, so, I can understand at the time a question mark going up of where you're getting the money from. And at that day, we <clears> couldn't <throat> say exactly where it was coming from. But now, this amendment, this motion, or this item identifies where the money's come from. I didn't feel like we were going to go back on anything on it. I just thought it was a matter of staff being able to come up with it. So I'm agreeing with you and also pointing out that at that point in time, we didn't identify exactly where it was coming from. So as I had mentioned, at that point, we had a $5.5 .5 million surplus. Dr. Spaulding had personally, I, I had personally phoned her. I know Chris had personally phoned her and both said prior to that resolution being passed, that we supported it, that we had the money to fund it, that we could have got the money from a variety of different sources. As you can see, there are several different ways we could have got this money. Um, and instead, a resolution was passed and, and brought in here that we were having a crisis because we had been responsible with the money for the schools. I'm just, I'm not um, questioning another board and their actions. Um, I do have a question, though, that I'd like to ask Rowan Cabarrus, and I could have asked you this the other day, and I apologize. Um, this has, um, is there anybody here? I'm sorry. Just, no. Okay. I would like clarification on exactly what's going, which you and I discussed it briefly, but exactly what's going in this location. It, th here's the reasoning. Um, at the Cloverleaf, they have cosmetology. I always forget how to pronounce the other one. There's the other one that deals with um, aesthetics. Aesthetics. I don't know why I have trouble with that word, but I always have trouble with that word, aesthetics. Um, and they have a computer lab that they use for um, 
job searching and which to me relates to the R Cube Center that they have, which is in another location in downtown Kannapolis. So I would just like what this says is cosmetology, CNA, paramedic and other programs. I just want to know is everything going there or my suggestion year and a half ago maybe was that the um, I thought that a good idea with the computers, the computer lab being used for um, job seeking would be a good a good thing would be to locate that where the um, um, DSS is in some of that space that hadn't been used because then you have somebody coming in asking for services and then right here we can also our cubes can help you with job applications and resume building and training so um, I'm, I don't believe that's what's happening or there hasn't been a commitment to do that but I just would like clarification and so um, I had asked county manager about that after our last meeting, um, but I didn't say it publicly, so I just just like some clarification on that. Um, the other thing I would like to tell you is that to the other commissioners, I don't know if you received the information or if it was just me, um, but there was an email that I received. Apparently, Cloverleaf is being either being purchased or yeah. it has been purchased by a different entity who has found out that they were moving, pr proposing to move, and they wanted to get some feedback from the community college about what they might be able to provide at the same location and I'm just gonna let you know that I did send that on because I didn't I you know you get an email and um, you don't always know who it's sent to depending on how you create your email so I wasn't certain if they had seen it or not and so I did send that on to make sure that they were aware that the new owners were interested in talking to them it's my understanding that the rent would be higher than what's in Kannapolis but we'll try to get some more information for all of you so that we can at least close that loop okay, and let you know. It's still a better location where they're at than Kannapolis, isn't it? As far as students from Cabarrus County been able to get their school in Cabarrus County? I would agree with your statement. I don't know that, Plus I don't know how many not, people would agree with you and me on that well, one. But, I, um, I think they ought to, if, 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 if um, the opportunity is there to stay where they're at with not too much more cost, it looks to me like it'd be better off to stay. And I have no idea. So uh, I just want to let you know that I had received the email from the new owner representative and forward it to Rowan Cabarrus for them to look at and be able to respond. So if I get anything, um, I don't check my email. I have to check it. It doesn't automatically pop on my phone. So if I get anything, I'll make sure I forward to you to everybody what their response is. How, how many just years so was that lease in Kannapolis for? Yes. A 20 year lease. Was it 20 years? Proposed 20 years. Yeah. At the same rate, I I've not seen the actual agreement or contract. I think there may be some um, inflationary increases in there over the years, but it's it's still a relatively small small lease. Yeah. Mike, how do you feel about the cost? I know that they had looked at um, several different facilities around the county, um, and, and I think we had talked about maybe you and I when we went on the tour up there that the downtown areas might be a little bit more expensive. How do you feel about the cost per square foot on the lease um, being in downtown versus some of the other facilities I know that were being considered? Uh, we, we, I would tell you that the, the amount of the proposed lease is very similar to what we have at our human services building, which is really relatively low. Um, of course, and, and then of course, We've always been responsible for paying for upfits. Uh, the same thing here, the, this this 1.5 plus a contribution from Kannapolis City, and then also from the state uh, that they would have to pay for the upfit up front, spread out the lease, and that's what helps keep those numbers down on the lease payment. So it's it's not debating the location, um, but but I think uh, the number that they've come up with is a relatively good number for a monthly lease payment. There's my understanding is there's about 10,000 more squeet, or excuse me, more more feet than they currently have. Um, for about, uh, I see, there's more square footage for an additional 10,000 square, uh, 10,000 dollars a year. Uh, and so it's quite a bit, I think, more square footage than what they already have. So we we see, um, you know, and. Uh, Commissioner Morris may be able to tell you what, about what, what's going on in, in uptown Kannapolis or downtown Kannapolis as far as rates, but 
we're seeing anywhere from five dollars to eighteen dollars a square foot depending on where you're at in the county uh, so uh, it's in the range that we've paid before I, I'll put it that way I mean it's it's I can imagine if you go somewhere out that's right out on the road and on 29 you may end up paying more uh, just simply because of location um, but we and I know they have looked at an exhaustive amount of buildings out there that has enough square footage to meet their needs and there's not a whole lot out there right now and that's uh, uh, we tried to find some location or some space at, at, at our complex up there for them we didn't have enough inside the building for them uh, and the problem is is they to maintain the they have a different definition of FTEs than we do but to maintain that size of campus and FTEs and, and to keep their current funding they all had to move together uh, we could probably have spread them out in different locations, but it would not have been considered a campus. Uh, but I think this, the square footage number is good. It's a very long lease, 20 years. So uh, <coughs> Maybe, could you uh, send me over the term sheet on the lease? Um, sure. And, and then uh, we can just take a look at it? Yeah, sure. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Are, are they taking over all that building or just one or two floors? I do not know the answer to that. I, I'll get that for you as well. I'll get the floor plan I've seen a preliminary floor plan but I don't know to the extent that they went out and took uh, the entire building so I'll, I'll make sure that everybody gets it that. is my understanding that they're taking <clears throat> the first and second floor I do not think the basement space is included in okay. the lease right. and I'm not sure what the plans are for that as far as the existing building um, if there were enough space available there to to perform what they're trying to do I don't think they would have been looking at the relocation. I think it's the lack of, of space and the configuration of the space was the motivation to begin the process looking when and they looked sure. at a number of different sites, but um, you know, had, had that current space been adequate, uh, then they probably would not be looking at the expense of moving. Yeah, I think I would agree with that too. And I apologize, <coughs> Dr. Spalding and I had a conversation this morning and um, we had talked about the, the gentleman that had sent the letter and that type of thing and trying to get an answer back to you um, and talked about the meeting this afternoon. So she did not miss this meeting on purpose through our conversations. She, she had asked, did I think she needed to be here? And I apologize. I said, I'm not quite sure that you need to be here, but you would need to be here for the regular meeting. So she did not miss this on purpose. It, it was it was our conversation. I told her that she didn't really need to be here today. But uh, I'll have the floor plans and I'll have the agreement for you uh, in the next tomorrow. So, okay. And and that's fine. I just the FTEs was is the thing that kept coming back because I when I made the suggestion about moving the our cube center and the computer labs, the comment was then our numbers are off and depends on how how state looks at the campus concept depends on what their funding is so I understand all that but I just wanted to verify based on the language in here that the computer lab is going to be there I definitely think the R cube center needs to be a part of wherever that computer lab is y'all know what R cubed is they started I think you do just for everybody's benefit when um, uh, Pillatex closed it's an effort to get people um, retrained for jobs and then they also were very instrumental with the closing of Philip Morris to help people and and they they do a really good job I mean the people that are up there are, are um, highly very qualified in helping people with resumes and job searching and everything but it seems like they have that synergy and they should be together so that was my main reason is just to make sure that's that I understand what they're really doing so um, anything else on this one okay we'll go to the next one and you have it I do and here again this is something that relates to the budget technically it would be approved right after the budget but um, there will be several ordinances then as well um, this is to update the small projects capital fund budget for um, 125,000 uh, in funds for surveys appraisals and the purchase of purchase of land for conservation efforts this is nothing to do with the general fund. This is the small projects fund, and it's basically taking funds that are um, unallocated within within them from the uh, special use funds when farmland, uh, they go back three years, 
if if they delete or develop it, they go back three years. Well, that tax is then put into this account to be used for this type of thing. So within your CIP, you will notice that there is 125,000 that's basically just switching within the, this fund from an unallocated to allocated to do uh, these uh, these purchase of conservation uh, properties or, or the easements um, related to the, the conservation. Okay, commissioners, any questions about this? Okay, thank you. Okay, next, um, Bob, are you going to? Oh, okay. Bob and Ben. Good evening. We have in front of you tonight two um, requests for uh, proposals regarding vehicle maintenance and then secondary transportation. Uh, the state required us to go out and get bids uh, as we had been three years at this point with these services and not had a bid. And this was a requirement of the state that we go ahead and, and secure bids. So we did the, the process working with uh, finance to get the request for, for bids out and receive the information and have are prepared to make some recommendations based on the information we have received that hopefully will continue to uh, provide good services and actually find us a little bit of savings as well. So I'll let Bob cover some specifics about the bids that we received, starting first with the maintenance, I believe. Okay, so we received three maintenance bids, uh, two for general preventive maintenance and one for brawn wheelchair maintenance. Um, we are requesting to uh, get approval to sign a contract with GMAX Automotive in Mount Pleasant. They came in as our lowest bidder. They currently do our, our uh, maintenance as well. They also will send somebody to pick up our vehicles and bring them back so we do not even have to take them down there. They also wash our vehicles and uh, clean the insides um, on a regular scheduled basis. And we also are asking to sign a contract with Grants LLC for our Braun wheelchair maintenance. Um, we've been using them for a number of years. They are certified with Braun and he travels the state and does uh, most of the counties in the state of North Carolina. He will come right to our facility and, and do the work on site. So there's no uh, time spent transporting the vehicles for that. The, the cleaning of the vehicles is a very great service that we get from GMAX as well too. Um, and them coming and getting the vehicles, it keeps us from having to take vehicles to be serviced. It's, it's a very wonderful service and they've done a great job for us in the past. Okay, Commissioner's questions? Hey Bob, my only question is um, if you think about where your location is up in Kannapolis, taking it down to Mount Pleasant, when you consider the mileage and the use on those vehicles and the gas, I know, you, I know it's not your time, um, is it, is it, does it still make them the cheapest when you add in those factors? Uh, compared to the other bidder, it does. The other bidder was in Concord, but uh, closer down towards uh, uh, Popular Tent Road. I think it would have evened out, plus we would have had to have took them and, and brought them back. How many vehicles do you guys usually have serviced in a year? your time I will have to get back to you on that. <laughs> just kind of curious <laughs> that's quite a bit <laughs> yeah yeah they they go on a preventive maintenance schedule and then of course there's issues that arise okay. you know headlights and brakes flat tires okay how many vehicles do you have in operation with? Uh, currently we are operating 30 32 but they're not all on the road at the same time there's spares okay Okay. Any other questions? Okay. And you, let's see, you have the next one yes. also. This one is in regards to secondary transportation, which of course um, we would love to be able to meet the total need that we have, but obviously we're, we're unable to do that. So we do contract with transportation companies to provide secondary transportation for our um, operations when we are unable to to provide that trip um, and we'll be talking about this in a little later in our presentation as well too but we had um, 
we are actually recommending two companies be awarded these bids based on the uh, costs that were quoted to us. Um, one is able to provide a service within the Harris area, yeah. area cheaper. And I'll let Bob talk about we that. We had two bidders. One of them was actually cheaper in Concord and Kannapolis, and the other was cheaper in Mount Pleasant, Midland, and Harrisburg. By awarding contracts to both, we will be able to choose, depending on the trip, the cheapest mode of transportation. That th those companies are TJ Taxi and A, A American, Alternative. American Alternative. I always want to say AT and T on that, but it's AAT. <laughs> okay, questions, commissioners. Generally, what um, whenever you have the need to to call a cab because you can't uh, provide the service, uh, what type of um, I guess I don't know. What type of category of transportation is that used for? Because I know you have, you know, the buses, you have the car, or yeah, buses. I'm sure you have the car. So what? Right. The largest would be Medicaid transportation. Medicaid transportation. Okay. And and often it's to provide trips out of county um, that we're unable to do. We do have some Medicaid clients that will go to specialty treatments that are not available here in Cabarrus County, um, and we can't it's hard for us to go outside because we right. basically tie up one van to go take one person to Chapel Hill, Duke, or even somewhere in, in uh, Charlotte. So we use them, typically a lot of them are for out-of-county trips. And then there might be something that just comes up on an emergency, an emergency area that we're not able to meet or an off-beat time or something that we may need to use the, the taxis or AAT. So if you have to hire a taxi to transport a Medicaid client to Chapel Hill, how much does that cost round trip? Uh, depending on where the client lives, it, it could be up you know, in a couple of hundred dollars. Um, it is Medicaid, so it is reimbursed back to us. Yeah, Medi Medicaid pays, pays right. for the trip. Right. I understand. Yeah. Right. Um, it, again, it just depends on where the client lives that we're transporting. Okay. How frequently does that happen? Where, where does Medicaid get their funds from? Taxpayers, federal, federal tax and state tax payers pay for it. And like Ben said, we're going to so we paying for it, right? We're going to talk more about that at our, yeah, our presentation. In a few we're going to discuss a couple of different alternatives that we're looking to save some money, uh, not only save money from the programs, but also um, try to we can we can run some of these trips cheaper than a taxi can run now uh, with some of our vans, and and so we're looking to expand that out. Therefore, we're not drawing down so much Medicaid uh, because, like you said, we're all paying for Medicaid. And, so. and Medicaid policy does um, require that if the service is available locally, that's the option that we take. Um, when the service is not available, it has to actually be authorized by physicians and so forth. And we have to, we will work, we have denied certain trips in the past because we say that service is available here. The client might be having comfort with another doctor in another county, but we say, well, that the service you're getting is here. We can only pay for what's here. Um, so we do have that leverage as well, and our staff do use that on the, on the DSS side. Do you get any kind of a special, I mean, obviously you're entering into a contract with these people. Do, do they give you a much better rate than they would give a member of the public, or are they um, rates that are mostly available to the public what do you, do you get a discount on the rates well American alternative I, I don't believe they do any general you know regular public transportation so I don't know that there is another rate for them uh, TJ's taxi I, if I remember correctly I believe we get a couple dollars cheaper uh, if, if they did a trip for a general public it, that was 25 I believe we're getting it for about 22 Any other questions at this time? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susie Morris, next for a proposed text amendment. Good evening. Um, what you have in front of you is a proposed text amendment to Chapter 7, which are our performance-based standards chapter and the particular use is number 67 temporary uses um, over the last 
six months to a year, Cabarrus County has had several requests for different types of events which involve public assembly. The initial text that we had adopted in the ordinance really didn't get into the details of what has to happen if you're um, proposing an event that has public assembly. So what this language does is essentially it walks the applicant through what the process is, um, and that's on page 33, and kind of tells them there's a preliminary application that they submit us, submit to us, and this is the process that we have been using and it has worked um, very well. Um, our emergency management director is also here if you have any questions uh, from the public safety side for him. So what happens is they come in, they do a preliminary meeting with us based on the application that they submitted. Um, we determine who should be at that meeting, whether it's cross-jurisdictional, um, whether it is, you know, they're going to have food vendors, so we need the Health Alliance there to provide the information. So it's really just to give them the information so that they know kind of what they're looking at when they come to Cabarrus County if they want to put on one of these events. Um, the second step through that is a full application, which they provide us with the staffing for the event, their parking plan, uh, a weather plan if that's needed. Um, so this is more for your festival types of events or events where you would have a gathering of a significant amount of, of people and the potential for um, increase in traffic or causing traffic jams. Also, um, you know, some type of an event itself uh, were there something to happen and you needed a mass response um, so EMS is involved so the language uh, talks about that it also clarifies that when you have these types of events um, there are some things that we are looking for if you're in a residential district you need to notify the neighbors uh, prior to the permitting if you need a noise permit from the sheriff so really it just <coughs> lays it out for them tells them up front here's what has to happen if you would like to put on one of these events in Cabarrus County um, we also have some clarifications related to uh, recreational vehicles um, we do not want folks living in recreational vehicles that is not permitted by the ordinance so we needed to clarify that that also what comes along with that is you know you really can't camp overnight you can't use those kind of vehicles as part of these temporary uses those are intended to be in campgrounds um, and then it just clarifies that if you have to you know if if we really can't fit you into one of these there is a similar and compatible category that we use but that if your event that you're proposing does include the public assembly that you're probably looking at several of these items listed under public assembly as well and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have um, you're probably aware we did have a Tough Mudder event here in Cabarrus County we had a Spartan race here in Cabarrus County that was very successful both of those were very successful um, and then in July, there is a color, a color festival proposed uh, for the Midland area where we've had to do some of that cross-jurisdictional planning uh, to make sure that everybody is aware of, of what's happening. Um, but there really has been an increased interest. Um, uh, there has also been several events planned across from the Speedway that are not directly related to the Speedway on the, um, the property there. I believe it's called 29 Events Property. Um, so there really is an increase. There's also an increase um, with the races for farmers, I believe, that are trying to find alternative revenue sources. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. The Planning <coughs> and Zoning Board did recommend uh, this for final approval to you all. It's been reviewed by Legal Text Amendment Committee, and then also the Fire Marshal's Office and Emergency Management. And you will need to hold a public hearing on this. Okay. Any questions concerning this? <coughs> no, I don't have a question, but I would say, uh, as you had talked to the people in, in Mount Pleasant that were potentially going to um, get a fire tax increase to let us know, um, if you're one of the people that does hold one of these events or you are a farmer or something like that, I. I hope that you take a good look at this and um, come and let us know what you think because um, you know you're somebody that's taking advantage of your own property and and really uh, there's a safety side of it but but I want to make sure that our property owners are represented as well so 
um, if you if you're a citizen of Cabarrus County and, and this is going to impact you come and let us write to us or let us know what you think or come to the public zoning hearing and let us know what you think anybody else okay. thank you thank you um, commissioners do you want to take about a 10 minute break just set the public hearing. So, oh we need to do a motion to set the public hearing I'm sorry um, can I have a I went to the next item okay so we need to amend the rules so that we can have a motion to approve um, to set a public hearing um, for the 16th for our regular meeting so may I have a motion to um, suspend our rules a motion is there a second? second motion second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed at this time I accept a motion to set a public hearing for proposed text amendment to zoning ordinance text 2014-00004 and the public hearing would be held at our regular meeting on June the 16th at 6:30 as or as such time as can be heard do I have a motion so moved have a motion to have a second? second motion second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed okay thank you Okay, now can we take about a 10 minute break and then we'll um, come back and we'll talk the last part of our conversation about the budget at, or at least at this point. So, thank you.